There we go. All right, welcome back to class. Please turn off your computers if your computers are on. And if uh, there's a computer that's next to you that's on, just go ahead and turn that one off too. So we're not heating up the classroom unnecessarily or wasting electricity unnecessarily. And so we could have pure and total darkness as we watch our videos. All right, somebody want to hit the lights over there? Uh, I was going to show you the China video. I was going to show you the China video, the Great Firewall of China. But I thought this one was a little bit more relevant to the conversations we've been having. So this is Mark Goodman, A Vision of Crimes in the Future. I'm talking about pluses and minuses. This, you know, what? Monday's video is kind of optimistic about the future of humanity in relation to technology. This one's a little more pessimistic. Crime in the future. Here we go. Oh. please? Just do the back ones. Thanks. Awesome. That's perfect. Oh, humans are scary. Scary humans. Crazy monkeys. We are a bunch of crazy monkeys. There are bad people out there. Computers should still be off. Okay, that's cool. So just hold it in and it'll go off for you. All right, good. Uh, what do you guys think? What are your thoughts? Don't use Twitter. Don't use Twitter? Why? Because if you're on somebody's hit list, you're telling them where you're at, what you're doing, and what, who you're with. At all times, you're tweeting, oh, doghouse, oh, we're going to help. Yeah, or we're Facebook status, or check-ins, or... Yeah. Well, if you're on somebody's hit list, I think, unless they're a really bad hit person, that's bad news. <laughs> Even if you aren't tweeting, bad news. But yeah, you know, thinking about what you put out there, how much information you share. I have uh, some friends who, when they go out of town, leave on their voice machine. Like right now, their outgoing message on their answering machine says, uh, uh, where did they go? We are in New York until August 28th. We'll be back Friday evening or whatever. It's like, oh, good. Let's go rob their house. <laughs> Yeah, so be careful what you put out there. What, what other thoughts do you guys have after watching this video? Certain groups are getting a hold of technology and using it to their advantage. Like, I guess like the games or whatever drug dealers are using, building cell, uh, cell phone towers. Yeah, holy cow, man. Right? I mean, crime is big business. Crime is big business. And uh, criminals... You know, and using technology to help run their organization. Like, they've put up an entire cellular network in Mexico, like one crime organization has, so they could have encrypted communication. Like, that's large scale. That's huge money. So they have that. Hmm? How's their government allowed them to do that? There isn't no government. There's a lot of corruption. There's not really a government there. They've had this problem for years, and they're only I mean, these people are going after the people in Mexico. I think they're just letting it just be more known that there is more of that going on. And they like they're, kill they're not children, being they about kill it. women, anybody. There's always stories on that. Do you have family in Mexico, Betty? Yeah. Yeah, yeah scary stuff. Mm -hmm. Mexico scares me. I don't want to go to Mexico for vacation. There's bugs in yeah, there. there's I'm not people going either. Mm -hmm. I am not going. Last semester I had a student who said uh, he went to Mexico and he almost got killed. He flew down to Mexico and then he's going out to see his family and some people took him at gunpoint and they're about to kill him. And then his uncle came up and said, wait, 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 don't kill him, he's your cousin. And they're like, oh, you're our cousin? And they put their guns away. <laughs> yeah. At least that was the story he shared with me. You know, it sounds fantastic, but it could be true, too. It seemed like it would be true. I didn't, you know, it seemed like, doesn't seem like the kind of guy to make it up. What else stood out to you from this video? If you can control the code, you control the world. Yeah, so that's a great echo. 
just sort of echoing something you heard. If you could control the code, you control the world. Control the code, you control the world. It's the amount of technology that's used nowadays. It's like how people like live off of it. They use their phones, their cars. You could hack into cars now that they have like the, the what's called the on store and stuff. You could control something like to crash. Yeah, you could and turn people's crazy. cars off remotely yeah. with OnStar. Just uh, kill power to the engine. Yeah, um, just the amount of technology used nowadays, it's kind of scary because yeah. you don't know who's controlling your stuff. Yeah. Unless you're walking. Yeah, in the woods yeah. by yourself. But even then, the satellites might be watching you. Yeah, you never know what you're wearing has like a chip. Yeah. You, you know, you went in for a root canal and they give you a little anesthetic. You went out and you came back and, yeah, your tooth's picked and we put in the tracer. <laughs> you don't know! <laughs> no, but cell phones trace us. OnStar traces us. All right, what else? What else? Other thoughts? Um, I, I think it's pretty interesting when you were mentioning the, the uh, pacemaker uh, surgically implanted. Well, I, I, would have, I had been thinking about it about two years ago that our, our safety and our protection systems are still flawed with the air, airports and stuff yeah, like that. Yeah, it's ridiculous. Yeah, it's stupid. I know that an older person or anybody who has a pacemaker, if they go through checking the, the, through the systems, as long as they, they didn't have to have paperwork, as long as they say and maintain that they have a pacemaker, they're allowed to go through. Well, any person, at least with some contacts with a terrorist, a terrorist organization can have... I mean, C4 surgically implanted into their body and claim that it's a pacemaker. Yeah. So when they're on the plane, bam, it goes Dude, off. Dude, I love it. I, we should become advisors to terrorists. <laughs> Seriously. I mean, I don't know what the pay's like. I, I hear your yeah. coworkers are a little dangerous. Yeah. 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 Like, just as likely to shoot you as pay you. But I agree. I agree. You know, I mean, obviously there's terrorist that, threats, or at least that's what's reported to us. Who knows if it's true? We don't know. Right, but in that video, the guy's saying, "Look, this guy was going to fly these two airplanes, remote control airplanes, into buildings with C4, and we stopped him." So, you know, obviously there are terrorist threats, and but I kind of feel like, really, is there a terrorist threat? Give me 300 people or a thousand people who are willing to die, and I can bring this country to its knees, you know, because thousands and thousands and thousands of migrant farm laborers come across from Mexico. Let's fly them all to Tijuana. They can come across the border. Right? Some of them are going to get caught, but the rest of them, you know, drive a, a tanker truck of gas into a mall and blow it up and do that four days in a row, and nobody's going to stores anymore in all of America. You know, nobody's going to go to stores anymore. And then you just do that for like two years. <laughs> you know? I don't know. So I kind of feel like the terrorist threat, really? What are we afraid of? You know, 5,000 people die and we lose two huge buildings, and now how many soldiers have we lost in Afghanistan and Iraq? And how many people die every year because obesity is such a problem in America and has drastically changed over the last 30 years? You know, what's the cause of that? You know, and how many people die because Philip Morris, you know, gets people into smoking? We lose jumbo jets of people every week to cancer from smoking. When you want to look at the real threats and keep Americans safe, the terrorists aren't the problem. Philip Morris, <laughs> right? And Nabisco and McDonald's, those are some of the big culprits for greed. I don't know, so I'm back off my soapbox. It's just a all in win Yeah, it's all corporate greed. People want money, a lot of it. Individuals looking out for their own self interest over the interests of the collective. At what price would you sell somebody down the river? You know? That's a really interesting question. Like, uh, I worked, like, with ethics, right? I worked uh, private industry for a while. And the more I could stick it to somebody, the more money I made in real estate finance, right? So if I could stick them with another quarter percent interest rate, I'd make another 1500 bucks. Yeah, screw them. 1500 bucks for me. Or do I look out for them and give them a competitive rate? You know? What else stood out to you from this video? I think it's a pretty great video. And some of the most terrifying stuff nobody's touched on yet. The bio stuff. Holy crap, crap, holy cow. Yeah, the bioweapons, weaponizing the avian flu virus, uh, yeah. biotechnology. I was just completely shocked that that's where they chose to put in the research to make something a lot more deadly. Like, really? <laughs> it's terrible. Oh, that that's where they chose to put their research? It's like, why not into something else when they decided to put oh. it into something more negative? 
Oh, yeah. No, we spend 50% of our tax dollars trying to figure out how to more effectively and efficiently kill other humans. That's 50% of our tax dollars is spent on defense in America. I think. Maybe I got that statistic wrong. We should Google it later. What's up? I have a friend that she's like a biologist, but she's getting yeah. more to the technology part. And she's yeah. saying that there's this robot that they're building that you're just giving material instead of building itself. The robot starts building itself? She's just giving material like metals, wires, instead of building itself. Yeah. And they're doing it to see what he comes out to. But she's kind of scared about it because what is that going to come out to be? Right. So they have right. all these kinds of technologies. Right. They can you know, buy body parts, and you know they don't need the mouse anymore. Right? You know, they just have the ear in the back or whatever. It's like Wally. How we're just all over the place. I'm not gonna do it. I'm gonna watch it. My oldest friend was like, "Oh, this is awesome. movie's so awesome." I was like, "That's scary." I know. Oh, he's standing up. All right, so I think that entire thing about bioweapons, biotechnology is kind of insane, kind of crazy. You know, akin to along the lines of, of uh, Stephen King and The Stand and, and the human apocalypse, right? And just, you know, in the past we had one kind of weapon, which was cataclysmically global, global, cataclysmically global in nature, at least that we know of, the A-bomb, right? We had the A-bomb. And only a few people had access to it. And we almost already screwed that up a couple of times as humans. Through accidents, we almost, you know, Russia almost launched at us. We almost launched at Russia. Okay? But now, right, with all the information that's out there, being able to genetically modify, you know, biotechnology and genes and code and all that, right, you know, who's going to learn how to be able to weaponize certain viruses? Like, these scientists almost published that research, and then somebody else might be able to go do it, and then just either, you know, haphazardly through, you know, just being whatever you call it, I can't remember the word, um, you know, unintentionally or just stupidly release it, or intentionally, either way, right? Somebody could release a virus, which could be pretty detrimental. So I think that's a pretty scary thing. And, you know, that could be accessible to a ton of people. So it's not just a few people who have their finger on the button, but a lot of people. Hacking life. One person, the ability for one person to affect many is uh, is the potentiality today, right? For positive or negative. What's up? Uh, you know, I'm gonna, I am going to uh, create a playlist on Blackboard. Right now on Blackboard, you have the lectures. So thank you. Uh, if, if you go to lectures to watch, I'll take you to this playlist, and these are lectures from class. But I'm going to create a playlist here also with the videos we're showing, because in these recordings I can't include these videos, otherwise YouTube says that's not your content, and they take my video down, or I don't know, send me nasty letters, threaten to take my video down. I'm not allowed to include other people's content. Nobody is. Um, so, all right, so they will be on there. Thank you for asking. And uh, the last, last thing I think was interesting is that entire thing about 3D printing. Who in here has heard about 3D printing? All right, so 3D printers, just like we have two-dimensional printers print on paper, 3D printers will take molecules and put them in certain locations so it could print objects. And so they've printed, they've printed human organs, they've printed kidneys, uh, they've printed different human Working organs. Kidneys? Right? Huh? Working kidneys? Yeah, they printed a human heart. What's it made of? Like flesh. Cells. <laughs> you know? You, you can see that up here on YouTube too. Like Printing kidney. Right? Oh, my Jesus. Yeah, so uh, TED Talk directors, printing a human kidney, right? And you could also print, you could also print uh, rubber duckies, you could print handguns, right? Well, handguns are getting a little bit sophisticated, but, you know, that technology is evolving and moving quickly. So, you know, the, the, well, the way, like just in the past, you'd have to go buy a book at the store. 
now you could, you know, theoretically download that book, legally or illegally, if it's, you know, not available for download. You could still go to websites and find that book and download it, download it, and then print it on your own printer. And you've got a copy of the book and you never had to go to the store. You got it digitally and you printed it and made a real hard copy. Well, in the future, we could, we could uh, digitize physical assets. Dis digitize physical assets. So you download the code for Stapler, right? This might even be how you purchase things in the future, right? You purchase it and then it downloads the code for Stapler and it says where each molecule is for this thing to work. And then your printer just prints each molecule into place and after two hours you have a Stapler and you just pull it out of your 3D printer. Well, you could download the, co the code for a gun then and just print a gun. Or download the code for a surface-to-air missile and just print a surface-to-air missile. You know, so that, that's kind of what this guy is saying about, hey, where are things going as we start to digitize phys physical assets and that code becomes available online, people can start printing all kinds of crazy stuff. So it's kind of an interesting world. Any uh, final thoughts on that video? No? Yeah? All right, so we saw some uh, optimism about technology on Monday. A little bit of a more pessimistic outlook today. And, uh, you know, it's a continuing race between ignorance and intelligence, uh, wisdom and stupidity. And the future of humanity hangs in the br brink. The future of humanity hangs in the brink. So if you uh, hear your name, I've dropped you because you didn't show up, or maybe I made a mistake, in which case, if you're here and you want to be in this class and you hear your name, come see me after class. Suhad, Ramon, Matthew, Lopez, Damon, Mayberry, Daniel Belos, Matthias Westfall. I passed out a couple of handouts, chapter one handout, with all the key terms, anybody not get it? All right, there we go. There we go. Yeah. Are we going to need one? Well, no. You don't need anything, really. You could just listen, but... Good idea to bring, bring materials. You don't need to bring the book. What have we been learning? Is Judy here? Um, Judy. Whoa! Got to work with the computers. I'm getting the hang of it. Not pro just yet. Finding out we're in a tech information revolution is pretty awesome. It's going on and I wasn't even aware of it. Cool. Tell me when to stop. Mercedes? Not a remain. Don't read yours. You gotta write don't read on it if you don't read. So we're gonna skip to the next one. Aaron. Aaron, I learned that social media is more powerful than just talking to friends, exploiting organizations, stopping crime, and sharing ideas. Yeah. Crazy world out there, man. Okay, so tell me when. Claudio. Claudio. Glad to do some work. I was lost at first, then I caught on. Tech. Technology is a great thing because we learn more info about things like search engines. Google. Cool. Claudio, tell me when. Uh, you're John. You're John? Yeah? Jump. Jump? I don't. <laughs> don't? Don't read it? Yes. Okay, well, you got to write don't read on it if you don't want me reading. I'm always curious why people don't want me to read. I understand shyness. Like, it's still a little bit hard for me to stand up and talk in front of people. It's kind of an interesting thing, you know, just to like, how am I doing? What do people think of me? Am I doing good? How am I in the polls? Am I doing bad? Uh, it's just an entire mind thing. I say just ignore it and stand up anyhow. Nick. Yeah. All right, Nick. I think it's amazing how our technology is changing all the time, and we are entering a new era in time where things will be new. And technology is always doubling, so we have to keep it up. Stop. <laughs> Hit 
Sorry. Here, I need that one actually. Hey, uh, Aziz Rashid. All right, I'm not sure if you're in Blackboard. Can you get into Blackboard? Don't try now, but yes. oh, yeah. yeah, you can get in? Yeah. All right, good. These computers give you guys away. You turn them on, it's like, I know you turn them on because there's that big sing song. It's like, you know, the spotlight goes right to you. Whoever just did that. And I have to say, who just turned their computer on? You couldn't help yourself? You're like, ah, I didn't even notice. My hand. My hand did it. It wasn't me. I found the culprit. It was my hand. Just guide your hand back to that computer and turn it back off. Uh, what are we doing today? I love it, you know, like class is half over and all we've done is watch a video and talk about it. Well, no, I'm just scared. You're scared? Yes. I'm scared too. We only got one planet. It's filled with a bunch of loons. <laughs> Looney Tune people. We're gonna die. We're gonna die. What did you learn from CIT 15? We're going to die, man. It is what it is. I just want to die quickly. I want to, I don't know, I want to see it happening. Ah, wait, I do not. Like, you know, if humanity's falling apart, I want to be there to the very end. You know, like, there's only a few people roaming the earth, like in Kung Fu. I want to be one of those people left. I call my sister, you better kill me if anybody comes. If you love me so much, kill me. That's dark. All right, what are we going to learn? What are we going to learn? Well, that's the very basics right there. <coughs> huh. All right, so let's talk a little bit about computers and how they work. And then I'll try to be done by like 10 after, 15 after, and you guys can work for another half hour. Work on a few more assignments. Ah, I, I knew that there was something I was forgetting. I'm like, it seems like there's something else I want to do with you guys. All right, so here we go. In here, don't go in yourself, right? But right now, uh, your grade thing, if you were here, you need to, not now, but in a minute or two, Right? If you were here the first week and you added late or something, you maybe got zeros for the first day or two, but you maybe were here. So come up after class and I'll give you credit for that. Say, oh, I was here the first two days. Or I was only here the second day, you know, whatever. Come up and I'll give you credit for it if you got zeros there. I want you guys today, when we do get on the computers, not now, but when we do get on the computers to check your grade and make sure you've got all the right zeros and ones for your participation for the days you're here. Because I've got a lot of zeros here and I need to throw people out. So I want to make sure that if you are doing something, you're doing something. But if it's like zero across the board and I look at your grade and you haven't done anything, you haven't showed up, you haven't turned anything in, I'm probably getting you out of here. Even if you are here. So when we turn computers on, just make sure you go look at your grade, okay? And, uh, and then come up and see me and I'll give you credit for these days if you added late or whatever. All right, so that's the important thing. Now back to computers running on electricity. So this is like the very basic uh, about how computers work. And while it's simplified down, while it's simplified, it still holds true. Okay, so at the most essential level, when people ask you, hey, how do computers work? Who in here knows how a computer works? Kind of, sort of. Yeah. Like, I have been in technology for a long time. And if somebody was to, like, say, hey, can you build me a computer? I'd be like, from scratch? No. <laughs> no idea how to do it. No idea how to do it. Like, a little bit of an idea, but to actually do it? Forget about it. Not going to happen in my life, even if I had the rest of eternity. Alternity is a long time. Maybe if I had eternity, I'd be able to manufacture, you know, silicon wafer manufacturing plant, right, and I'd be able to do all that, but in my life, uh, hard, okay? So I'm going to teach you just sort of like the, the concept behind what's happening inside computers, but actually like understanding, you know, like, you know, how to build a CPU or a silicon wafer, a chip, that's going to be difficult. I don't even know that. All right. 
So that's my caveat. Uh, so computers run on electricity. Like, that's it, man. That's like the starting place. Computers run on electricity. And electricity has two discrete states. And I say discrete because I mean on or off, not like a dimmer switch with a lot of, you know, variations between on and off. Two discrete states. It could be on, it could be off. And basically that's a computer at its most basic level. It's a switch that could be on or it could be off. So a computer will do four things. When we define what a computer is, a computer does four things. It receives input, it's IPOS. It's kind of like iPod, but instead of a D, it's an S, IPOS. It receives input, it can process that input, it produces output, and then it can store the results. What's that mean? You can type at the keyboard, you can use your mouse. You're giving the computer input. The computer can process. Oh, you're typing the letter A. And it could show you the letter A on the screen. Well, that's output. It's showing you A. It could print that letter A on your printer. That's output. So you could do input, you could type, it could process that and know it's the letter A, and it could show you the output, right, on your screen or on the printer. And then it could store that. It could store the letter A. Right? And later you could open up the file, and there is my A. Look at my A. Isn't my A beautiful? That's what all of you guys are coming here for. You want A's, right? You're looking at me like, what's he talking about, A? You all come to school. It's like you want A's. You're the ones who think it's important. So can we store stuff with electricity? Can we store the letter A with this one light? Can we store the letter B with this one light? Just one light. Screw having two lights, screw having two trillion lights, two trillion switches, right, where we can store stuff. Let's just start with one light, one switch. Can we store the letter A with this one switch? No. Can I store the letter A here? No. I think so. Because doesn't, doesn't uh, information like in a computer travels to like the... Uh, uh, Great answer. I love it. Of course. Absolutely. You're on the right track. So, I'm going to create a coding scheme. So, you're getting a couple of key words here. You got IPOS, those are the four things a computer does. And you're getting coding scheme. Are coding. You, saying, like, you can do it with like one and one. Is that what you're saying? Like, if you get into like, the Zeros one and one. ones? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, I that's where it all comes from. Zero and one. That's what you meant. I was like, I thought you meant just one, one. I didn't know you meant like one, one, and then you haven't found the one. She's talking binary on me. I can't even understand her. You're beyond me, but you're going the right direction. All right, so I'm going to create a coding scheme. All right? And that coding scheme, I'm going to store information with one light, one switch. That coding scheme is that if uh, the switch is on, I'm storing the letter A. If the switch is off, I'm storing the letter B. Okay? A, it's on. All right? B, it's off. So you tell me which one I'm storing. Uh -huh. I'm storing B. That's the letter B. I have stored the letter B. Okay? What about now? Oh, you can see it. A. I've stored the letter A. Right? So computers run on electricity. Electricity has two discrete states, on or off. With one switch, one light, I could store messages. I could store information. I can store the letter A, I can store the letter B with one light. With one light, I can store two pieces of information, A or B. So now I, I can receive input from somebody. This, this switch just received input, and I could store that. And then I, I could look at my coding table, and I could say, oh, that's the letter A. Right? This is Morse code. Da 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 Right? That's Morse code. It's a coding scheme based upon dots and dashes. They use it with lights. Right? So we could we could store stuff based upon the configuration of lights. We could start storing information. So we could receive input, we could store stuff, and we could do output. Hell, we're three fourths of the way to having a computer. All we gotta do is figure out that P thing. Right? Figure out how to do processing without a computer. We input, output, storage. The processing part is the hard part. <laughs> but these other three parts are important. All right. So with one light, I can store two pieces of information. What about if I have two lights? How many pieces of information can I store? Four. Four. Wait, more actually. Because they can both be off. 
They could both be off. Top one could be on, but bottom one off. Wait, hold on. They could both be off. So, and then on off. Any other possible combinations? No. Nope. That's it, right? Maybe I could have even just said, hey, let's let zero represent off and let's let one represent on. Wow, that starts to look like zeros and ones. And I always see zeros and ones associated with computers. Those zeros and ones just mean that the switch is on or off. That's all they mean. And then we could say, hey, if we have this configuration of off and on, it can mean A. And if we have that, it can mean B. And if we mean that, it can mean C. And if we have that, it can mean D. Well, now I can store a whole bunch of messages. I can, I can store four characters of the alphabet. So with two lights, I can store four characters of the alphabet. How many lights would I need to store the whole alphabet? How many letters of an alphabet? I always forget. I know, it's like one of those questions that's like, I don't know. It's like 25, 26. So how many lights would I need to store all the characters of the alphabet? Eight. Eight? Thirteen. Thirteen lights? All right, so let's go with eight. How many messages could I store with eight? How many messages could I store with eight lights? Or how, how, many, how many different combinations? If I have eight lights, how many different combinations are there? How many different... All right, let's come back. What if I have three lights? What if I have three lights? How many, how many can I store? Nine. Nine? Good guess, but incorrect. Six? Good guess, but incorrect. So here is the way you figure it out. You've got two possible states, on and off. Right? For each light, you have on or off. This is the formula. You have two possible states, on or off. And depending upon the number of lights you have, right, you can use this formula where n is your number of lights. So if we have 2 to the 1, we could store 2 messages. If we have 2 to the 2, we could store four messages. If we have three lights, two to the three, we could store eight messages. If we have eight lights, we could store 256. If we have four, we could store 16. If we have five, we could store 32. So we need five lights to store all the letters of the alphabet. We need five lights to store all the letters of the alphabet. All right? And then by whatever combination of on or off, Right? I could represent like, oh, this, you know, five lights. I could say, just ignore this. Let's make that the fifth one there. I could say, hey, that's the letter N. So with five lights, I could store 32 different pieces of information, depending upon how I configure these ons and offs. Isn't it for the capital letters with the different codes? Right, and then it's like, oh, well, let's include capitals too. Okay, now we're going to need like, you know, 6, because that will be 64. 2 to the 6 is 64. Do these numbers sound familiar? Like 32-bit, 64 megabytes, 128 megabytes, gigabytes, 256, right? Do those numbers sound familiar? Those are computer numbers because it's all 2 to the n. 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64, 128, 256, 512, 1024. Right, that's all two to the end stuff. So it's all about storing information. When when I when I when I am in Microsoft Word and I type in like the letter A, right, literally what has just happened is zeros and ones have been stored, light switches have been turned on or off to store those zeros and ones. Right? To represent the letter A. So let's look at this a little bit. Electricity has two states, on and off. This is not working. I will have to do it the old-fashioned way, my friend. So with one light, I could store two messages. 
If the light's off, run away. If it's on, come in. It's my coding scheme. I could create any coding scheme. So this is like Paul Revere, right? One by C, two by land, or whatever. I could send messages depending upon how those lights or those switches are configured. Two lights, I could store four. All right? With three lights, I could store eight. And I could also just have those be zeros and ones. Instead of on off, I could just have them, you know, all the offs be zeros, all the ones be on. So I could just break the code down that way. And I could say, hey, it's the alphabet instead. All right, so let's test this. What, what does that say over there on the right? Here, I'll help you. B. A. 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 D. C. C. A. A. B. B. Bad cap. So you guys just learned how to send a message in, you know, binary using my coding scheme. That was a bad cap. It's not a very complex message, but you're starting to speak computer language or machine language. So computers run on electricity. Electricity has two states, on and off, right? And then, you know, the formula is two to the n, because electricity has two states, on or off, so it's two, and then n is the number of on or off light switches you got, right? So with eight lights, we could store 256 things. Two to the eighth would be 256. Two times two times two times two times whatever, eight times, all right? And uh, we'll call those, the 16 lights, we could store 65,000 things. 32 lights, we could store four billion things. With 32 lights, four billion different combinations, 4.29 whatever, all that. And then these are called bits. Um, let's talk about the generations of computers first, then we'll come back to binary digits. All right, so the first computers use something called vacuum tubes. And a vacuum tube looks kind of like a light bulb to store whether or not the circuit, the switch, the transistor was on or off, right? So vacuum tubes. So they'd actually be a light kind of thing that would go on or off. First computer had like 18,000 of them. We're talking 1940s. The ENIAC, the UNIVAC, they built it, once again, to kill people more efficiently, right? They wanted a computer, one, they wanted computers to help break the code that the Nazi Germans had, right? So we could understand where they are going, and actually we did break the code, and, uh, but then we didn't, you know, we kind of, we sometimes, we kind of always act on the messages, because then we would have tipped our hand that we knew what, we knew what they were communicating, right? If we never, you know, walked into their traps. If we always knew where they were going, they would then assume, oh, right, we talked about this? No, other class. Right, and they also want to be able to calculate trajectory of shells fired from ships more quickly. And so that was the primary purpose of, I forget which, the UNIVAC or the ENIAC. ENIAC. One of them was military, one was commercial. So they had 18,000 vacuum tubes. So there's only 18,000. Only 18,000? If you guys had $18,000, you'd feel like, wow, I have a lot of money. Or if somebody said, here's 18,000 light bulbs, you'd be like, whoa, dude, what am I going to do with 18,000 light bulbs? You'd be like, that's a lot of light bulbs. Really, keep the light bulbs. I just need one. <laughs> right? You'd be like, you're crazy with light bulbs. Why do you buy 18,000 light bulbs? Because it filled up like two of these rooms. You know? It, but that was like, they could turn it on or off. Well, you know, it was a little problematic. Because those would, it all, the computer could only run for like seven minutes before some of those light bulbs would burn out, some of those vacuum tubes. And then they'd have to actually go into the computer and physically replace them. Replace them. And then moths would fly into the computer because it was warm. Those vacuum tubes were warm. And then the moths would die in short circuit the computer. So they'd have to go into the computer and debug the computer. Literally debug the computer, which is where that phrase comes from. <laughs> So the first computer was vacuum tubes, then they created transistors. And I'll show you guys these things next week. I'll bring some in. Those were a lot smaller, ran cooler, didn't burn out. 
All right, so that was like, you know, in the 50s. And then they created integrated circuits or chips, silicon wafers, All right? And I'll bring in a chip. But that's about the size of your fingernail, okay? And, uh, and so they took something that was about the size of my fist and 18,000 of them filled two rooms. And then they were able to create chips Right, like in 1971, they had a chip with 2,300 circuits on it, right? Circuits that could be turned on or off. So don't get freaked out by the word circuit. This is a circuit, a circuit that could be turned on or off, right? That's all vacuum tube was, that's all transistor was. By 1971, they created a chip that had 2,300 of them on something the size of your pinky fingernail, smaller. Wow. Right? So imagine taking 2,300 of anything the size of your fist and putting them onto something the size of your pinky fingernail and the thickness of your pinky fingernail. So those are chips. And then the fourth generation computers are characterized by microprocessors or CPUs, where they just integrated a couple of components, the arithmetic logic unit, you know, the fetch decode unit, like registers. They integrated all these into one processor. That actually happened, I don't know what year, but I think it was 1971 with, uh, with uh, Intel. Intel created it. How many transistors are on today's computers? Well, in 2008, according to this, they had about two, 2 billion on something the size of your pinky fingernail. Two billion of these. Two billion of these on something the size of your pinky fingernail. So it all all start it all c comes down to storing information. Right? Storing information. Zeros and ones. Where a zero is off and a one is on. And then we could have that arrange those combinations of zeros and ones represent things. We could create coding schemes. So certain combinations of zeros and ones can represent capital letter A. Another combination of zeros and ones can represent lowercase n. Another combination of zeros and ones can represent uh, magenta, a very precise color, right? And so when you have a picture and this one little dot, right? This one little dot is this combination of zeros and ones. The computer knows display magenta in that little microscopic dot. And you get enough of those microscopic dots displaying precise colors, it looks like a nice image. You know, that's how image, image data is stored. It's just zeros and ones, how movie data is stored. It's just images, but then you have like 30 of them every second. That's how sound data is stored. 44,100 kilohertz, that's 44,100 samples of the sound every second. And what's your bit depth of that sound, right? Like how many, how many bits do you store for each sample to represent, you know, and then that sounds kind of like MIDI, not too much data there. MIDI sound, right? But that's how sound stored, zeros and ones. And when the computer sees a certain configuration of zeros and ones, it plays this precise sound. You know, that's what goes through the speakers. And do that 44,100 times a second for three minutes, four minutes, and you got a nice song. That's a lot of zeros and ones. So that's kind of like the basic, you know? That's the basic. Those zeros and ones are called binary digits. Binary, binary, because bi is like, I don't know, Greek, Latin, etymolo etymologically speaking, whatever, I don't know, for two. Bicycle, biplane, I don't know, bi, two, right? So binaries, there's two states, on or off, or two numbers, zeros and ones, and those digits are either zero or one, binary digit, zero and one, so we call it a bit. So, you know, one binary digit is either a zero or a one, right? And so we could store, you know, like, if we have one bit, it's a binary digit. If we have eight bits, we call it a byte. If we have 1,000 bytes, we call it a kilobyte. If we have 1,000 kilobytes, a megabyte. 1,000 megabytes, a gigabyte. 1,000 gigabytes, a terabyte. And I know 1,000, 1,024 bytes is actually a kilobyte. I'm just approximating. 
And I don't always have all the answers, so if I get something wrong, correct me. But one terabyte translates to, well, there's million, there's billion, there's trillion. I don't know what even comes after trillion. Yeah, a, a, a whole junk a lot. Billion. <laughs> right? It's like that far out. That's a lot of zeros and ones. You got a one terabyte drive. And you could buy them at Costco for less than 100 bucks, a one terabyte drive, or wherever. So you're storing all that video data, all that song data, all that picture data, all that text data. And what's it all come back to? Computers run on electricity. And electricity has two discrete states, on and off. So the last thing I'm going to say is there's this concept called Moore's Law. Here's Gordon Moore. He was one of the main two dudes at Intel. Intel does not stand for intelligence, though, you know, it gains a lot of mileage also having that association, I think. Intel actually stood for integrated electronics, right? Integrating electronics like into uh, one microprocessor, one CPU, integrating them all into one place. So uh, Gordon Moore is one of the founders, and he said back in the 60s, you know, uh, technology is pro proceeding at such a rate that every 18 to 20 months it's going to double. That was Moore's law. And it's held true since the late 60s or early 70s, whenever he said it. I think it was like 67 or 68. I don't care. Sometimes, you know, you worry too much about details, and you lose the, the larger truth or whatever. Who cares? Details. You can look it up if you really want to know. So every 18 to 20 months, technology doubles. That's Moore's law. What does that mean? That means that if you buy a computer today, do you mind hitting the front lights? Oh, you're going to miss a good part. Can you wait? Two, four minutes. No, uh, do it the other way around. Yeah, just turn them all on. Thank you. So if you buy a oh, turn them all on? No, that's great. Just the way it is. If you buy a computer today, and that computer has the power of one, right? In 18 months, it'll have the power of two. So 18 months, right? 18 months. Uh, oh, it won't have the power of two, but computers coming out in 18 months will be twice as powerful. Sorry. Huh? 18 months to 20 months. If I said two years, then I could have said that. Sometimes it's Said, people say that, but it's actually 18 to 20 months. So every 18 to 20 months, technology doubles. That's Moore's Law. So in another 18 to 20 months, new computers will be again twice as powerful. And what's twice as powerful as two? Four. Four. Right? So it's ex exponential. And in another 18 months, right, computers will be twice as powerful. So what's twice as powerful as four? And in another 18 months again, right, twice as powerful. And so now we have 16. So 18, 18, we got 36, we got 72 months. 72 months is six years, right? And here we have three years, okay? So sometimes people come to me and they say, hey, you know, my computer, it's really running slow. I was hoping you could look at it. You know, something's wrong with it. It just doesn't work like it used to work. It used to work, like how long you had this computer? Not that long, maybe four years. Five years? That's a long time. It's time to throw that computer away. Just get a new one. Really? Throw it away? Yeah, just recycle it. Give it to somebody else. Send it to electronics recyclers. It's time for a new computer. Four years, though, that's not that long. And technology is a long time. All right? Like, you looked at that one video. We saw Information Revolution on Monday. Yeah. And it looked like, man, that looks junky. Look at how old that technology looks. That was 2008. Four years ago. You know? Because in four years... You know, a little more than four years. Computers that are being made then, four years after your computer came out, are eight times more powerful than your computer. And so software that's being written now is being written for computers that are eight times more powerful. So your computer is trying to run software, right, that is written for people who, computers that could run eight times powerful, you know, software, and yours is one time. That's like if your computer is a weightlifter, your computer can lift 100 pounds. And now the software that's being written today is asking your computer to lift 800 pounds. Well, no wonder your computer's struggling. 
It's only built to lift 100 pounds. You're asking it to lift 800 pounds. That's why technology, right? Computers get dated so quickly. All right, you can go. That's some important stuff. What's up? So often changing to computer. You know, if you don't change the software, you can keep your computer forever. You can still run Apple IIe's. You just can't run, you know, Internet Explorer on them. You have to run the software that's written for the Apple IIe. You know, you could run computers from the 90s, but you've got to run Windows 95 or Windows 98 on them. I was saying before it gets like frustrating and just super slow before you can like actually tell a difference between like okay, when you get a car, like you first get it, it runs really smooth, and after like wear and tear, like it feels like it runs more like rough. Like same thing with the computer. When you start feeling it, like, yeah. So uh, you know, somewhere between five years, four to six years, I think, four to six years. And the computer in my office, man, I've been running it for seven years. Do you like change the software? No, I just got a really powerful computer seven years ago, and. <laughs> You know, and now it's you know I just and I don't I don't do a lot of powerful stuff on it. It's like web browser and operating system and email and grading. Actually, I had a video on it, so I don't know what I'm talking about. But it even does that okay. So it's hanging in there. All right. So that's Moore's law. And you saw that in that video. So I just threw a lot of information at you. Anybody have any thoughts, reflections, comments, questions? There you go. That's probably why phone companies and computer companies make the newer things that are more expensive and more cheaper because we always recycle stuff when we get rid of them and throw them away all the time. Is that um, basically, is that whole true? So like why, why are things becoming, uh, thank you for bringing up price, because processing power per dollar doubles every 18 to 20 months, right? So processing power, what you get for your buck, in 18, 20 months, you'll get twice as much. So um, why things come down in price, like because computers used to be $2,000 and today you can get them for 600. I think that has more to do with, you know, uh, manufacturing capability and capacity of the tech manufacturing market and the ability to churn this stuff out. Like in the past, maybe they didn't have as much and so that entire supply demand relationship, there's less supply and there's more demand, and so they could charge a higher price, but now they're able to pump a lot of this stuff out. I don't know. I don't know why it's things are, computers are only 600 bucks today, and a while, not too long ago, they were 2,000, you know, kind of to get. But, you know, like, you, you know, I've got a MacBook Pro, which I dropped, the school bought, and it was 3,300 bucks, you know. Um, so you could still get, you know, really high end. These computers were super expensive when we bought them. You get high end ones. Good question though. But there's also much more, like maybe also the power of, you know, what we need to do. Like you could reach that now with just a six hundred dollar computer for ninety nine percent of what most people do with computers. Uh, other questions. How many people? Let me see a show of hands. Feel like, oh, okay, I kind of got a basic understanding of how computers work. So if somebody is asking you how the computers work, you say, oh, they run on electricity. Electricity has two states, on and off. You know, if I have one, like, light bulb or circuit or switch, I can store two things. Your friend will be like, what? What are you talking about? What's that? How do you learn how to write code? Um, it's like how you learn anything. How do you learn anything? I mean, I mean, like literally, like what would I be? What would I have to do to learn to write code, computer code? Yeah. Okay. So uh, flip the light switches for me. But you know, like so that that answer is just oh, you just gotta start looking for resources. Like I'm learning to play the guitar, so I went online. I'm like learn to play the guitar, and then there's guitar websites that teach me to play the guitar, and I sign up for one, and I could like watch videos and it teaches me how to play guitar. Well, there's that kind of stuff that's out there, right? Or there's classes here, I could come take guitar. Likewise, there's classes here, you could come take programming. Or you could go online, and you could say, hey, I want to learn how to program. And, or you could, you know, then also start talking to a computer person. So uh, one of the big things is what language do I want to program in? So a really good language to program in is Java. Uh, very transportable, very 
all over the place, ubiquitous. And, and uh, so how do, I, how do you learn Java, right? You can take classes here, or you could go online. There's also a really good website, lynda.com. I'm pushing the wrong key. lynda.com. And so they, they have really good videos for how to use software or web programming. They have good web programming. I don't think they have Java programming. They do. They have Java, dude. So you can come in here and you can start learning Java. Java essential trainings, up and running with Java, foundation programming, object-oriented design, right? So you've got 11 hours, 12 hours of lectures here. You could watch on programming Java for 25 bucks a month. And they're, they're good. She's got this, this website. It's good stuff. I think they're out of Santa Barbara or Ventura. So I'm sure they've made a ton of money. I really like this. I wish I'd started it. Actually, I wish I'd started this company. But, you know. I should log my friend out. Should we post on our her wall? Go for it. As. There we go. Maintain collegial relations. Any other questions? Turn your computers on. Feel free to work on whatever you like for the next 30 minutes. I got a little video to show you in the class. Kind of a counter video to the pessimism thing. Go in on the Apple side if you want sound. You have to choose the Apple icon if you want the headphones with sound. Look at your grade. If you have something on your grade that's not right, come tell me and I will update it.